John. I have a really interesting John's Briefs for you today. I'm here with Mark Victor from Attorneys for Freedom. And Mark is one of the premier self-defense attorneys in the country, certainly here in Arizona. Uh, he's the guy that I would want uh, defending me if ever I had to use my firearm in self-defense. And uh, we have an interesting one today because we have a significant difference of opinion about carrying around in the chamber. And, uh, you know, I just asked Mark if we could argue about it on camera, and he agreed to do that. And so I am going to step into the fray and argue with someone who argues for a living. So let's <laughs> talk about it. So I think that this one really personally, from my perspective, I think why this is valuable is what it's going to show us is that you deal with people who have negative outcomes that are different than the people that I deal with that have negative outcomes. And that gives us different perspectives. So um, I'm going to make opening statements and then I'm going to let you make yours and then we, we, we can do this a little bit debate style. Sound fair? Fantastic. Awesome. So here's my opening statement. The people that I see that have a problem in a gunfight, if you need a gun in a fight, you're going to need it right now. And I have seen people, a good number of people, killed because they did not have a round in the chamber. And I've seen people lose the element of surprise in a counter ambush because they had to rack around in the chamber. I've seen people that don't have that second hand um, in order to do so, and because of that, lose their life in a gunfight. And so that's the biggest reason that I say, listen, you have to carry a firearm safely. It should always be carried in a holster that completely covers the trigger guard. It should be a, a firearm that's drop safe. So then that way, if God forbid, it falls out, it doesn't go off. Um, but that around in the chamber from the perspective of a defensive firearms trainer is a necessity. Your turn. I think your point is very well taken. And, and we may uh, ultimately be disappointed because we may not have that much of an agreement here or disagreement here. I, I tend to, like I say, agree with everything you said. I think the issue uh, needs to be addressed a little bit more from the 30,000 foot view because I think that, and this happens all the time when you're talking about self-defense, people like bright line rules. Mm. Hey Mark, if someone's in my house, can I shoot them? I need a little bit more detail <laughs> than that, right? I guess these kind of bright line questions, even- To invite the Kirby man in to show you his vacuum? Then no, you can't shoot him, anyways. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I think it's hard to give advice that applies to everybody. Okay. So let's make a couple of different groups here. Group number one, the uh, trained police officer, the trained civilian, the person who uh, carries on a regular basis, who really is very well uh, acquainted with the operation and they're used to the way their firearm works, and or the person who is in a situation where they may be more likely to need to pull their firearm and discharge around immediately, right? Okay. You're in a dangerous area, you've got a dangerous job, something like that. For that group of people, I have absolutely no beef with carrying around in the chamber. In fact, um, if I was gonna carry my firearm and I was gonna go into an area that I thought was uh, reasonably dangerous, probably smarter not to go there in the first place, but I might be inclined to carry with around in the chamber. I can tell you that the guns that I keep at my house uh, that I don't carry, that are at my house, those all have around in the chamber. So I think in that situation, um, certain situations, it makes a lot of sense. For everybody else, the weekend warriors, the okay. people who don't carry very often, what you have here is a risk on both sides. Mm. On one side, you have the risk that you are going to need to pull and discharge around immediately. And there certainly are cases. I saw, by the way, on your site, there were some uh, videos on uh, situations where people needed to pull in and discharge it. Absolutely right. On the other hand, if you do a little bit of a search, you'll also come up with uh, negligent discharges, yeah. lots of those as well. And so it also depends on what state you're in and how they treat the negligent discharge. Because here in Arizona, a negligent discharge is really an accidental discharge. Mm -hmm. It's, oops, I made a mistake. I did what I did not want to do. Right. That, I, that oops costs you mandatory prison here in Arizona. Mm. Even the oops in your own house where nobody's around, where the round just hits the wall or goes into the wall. I've had people call the police on that and say, you know, I discharged my firearm. They're going to jail and they're going to get charged with a dangerous mandatory prison felony. This happens quite frequently. And wow. so when I weigh the risks and I say, what is more likely to cause harm to the person's life. The person who is not so skilled, 
with a firearm, the person who's not in an area that they're going to likely need to draw in, uh, they don't have enough time to maybe with two hands go ch -ch -ch, uh, on that side. Balancing that with the other side, the oops accidental discharge, I think your chances of going to prison on a case like that, or if not going to prison, picking up a felony offense and losing your firearm, mm -hmm. your right to keep and bear arms, maybe for the rest of your life, puts you in a very uh, precarious position. So I would maybe qualify it and say, look, if you, if you are somebody in the first box, as I uh, described, uh, a police officer, someone in a dangerous area, someone with lots of training, you want to carry with a round in the chamber, fine. Be damn careful, you don't have an accidental discharge. Everybody else who's carrying a firearm as they're going out to... Uh, Scottsdale here to have dinner and they have no reason to think they're going to have any problem whatsoever, probably better off to not put the round in the chamber because that almost completely eliminates the chance of a negligent discharge and it certainly puts you at a tactical disadvantage if you got to pull immediately, but that trade-off makes sense to me for the person who's not highly trained. Yeah, I, I hear what you're saying, Mark, but I think that, uh, and, and I love that you have different groups here, right? So, of course, my first thing is, if you are going to accept the responsibility of carrying a firearm, then it is incumbent upon you to do so safely, morally, and legally, okay? So I would never recommend, I certainly would never recommend on video carrying a firearm where you're not allowed to carry a firearm or to do so in unsafe ways at all. So go watch the holster video, right, about making sure that your holster completely covers the trigger guard, holds the firearm securely, has to do all those things. Because, you know, where I see people have problems is, is that their gun falls out of their holster and then goes off when they go to pick it up, like the FBI agent in the club not too long ago. And, um, or the ATF agent yeah. who was showing the firearm in class. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, the guy, I'm the only one professional enough to carry a gun in here. And, and I know people that are saying, oh, it could never happen to me. It, it could happen to you, okay? So here's my thing for that. It, when I see this stuff happen to, and I don't know what your perspective on this is, is that a lot of these negligent discharge, in fact, I would say all of them, are in non-emergency situations. Mm -hmm. So it's administrative handling of the firearm that causes the problem. Okay. Now, whether that's, oh, okay, when I get in the car, I take the gun out of the holster and I put it in the console, which is stupid, don't do that. Leave it on your person if you're carrying it on your person. Or when I get home, I take the gun out and put it on my nightstand. Well, that's when your finger can get on the trigger and that's when negligence can happen. Or you are carrying in a purse and you put your purse in the cart and your two-year-old digs into your purse for you know, a, a piece of gum and gets a hold of your gun. And yes, a two-year-old can pull the trigger on a firearm, no problem. And, and all those things are not accidents they're negligence they are not taking the required amount of care with a firearm so i think the better way and, and I, okay so at the end of the day i agree with you if you are not willing to put in the work to safely handle a firearm i honestly you have the right to keep and bear arms but it doesn't mean you should well we're still keeping and bearing arms the only question is whether the round is in the chamber and i think you know to try to say i'm so highly trained that i could never have an accident yeah, or discharge that's just, it's just not realistic. We're yeah. humans, we make mistakes, it happens a lot. It happens to very highly trained people as, as we've talked about yep. even in this situation. Even in the, I think the ATF agent was the best example. Here's a guy who's being careful, who is highly trained, who's in the classroom, who didn't realize he had a round in the chamber and he, and he discharged a round right there in the classroom. If he can do that, so can we, it can happen. And um, you know, and the odds that you're gonna need to pull your firearm or slim to begin with, the odds that you need to pull it in, you don't have the two hands available to just go ch -ch in a quick second, which by the way itself could be a deterrent. Um, it also reduces the, the things that you very astutely noted about um, minors or maybe even animals or just accidents, things that happen and that's just life in the big city. And I'm afraid um, for maybe a certain group and, and maybe the majority of people that um, having a round in the chamber, look, some, somehow in Israel, the entire Israeli army, surrounded by dangerous guys on all sides, has managed to have proper security without having a round in the chamber. You've brought up Israeli carry. Aha, uh -huh, you've stepped into my wheelhouse. <laughs> sir, yes, sir. Okay. So uh, I, my, my discussion on, on Israeli carry, this is what we talk about carrying without a round in the chamber. I think, first of all, we have to recognize uh, the context of them carrying their, their sidearms, number one. Number two, we have to recognize the context of how that came to be. When the Israeli Defense Force was made in 1948, they had people carrying their own uh, sidearms. In, they didn't know what kind of holster 
and w they didn't know what kind of training because this is a brand new militia, basically. And so in order to standardize training, they said, we want a full magazine in an empty chamber so that when you draw the gun, everybody does the same thing. Um, and so, of course, if I'm training a group of conscripts in a militia that I don't know what kind of gun are they carrying, a striker fire gun, are they carrying a hammer fire gun, is it single action only, is it double action, single action, I don't know. So we all start in the same place, okay, fine. Um, they still do that in the Israeli army, even though in the Israeli army, all of the, the soldiers are now carrying the same firearm in the same condition in the same holster. So the funny part to me is that the reason for it has gone away, but they've maintained the dogma. Unless you consider the reason for it as being an accidental discharge. I mean, it's certainly possible that uh, the powers that be, we don't know because we're not talking to them, but it's certainly possible that they may say, look, we, we're willing to have a tiny little bit of trade-off in terms of readiness to avoid the possibility of lots of things can go wrong if a round in a chamber is accidentally discharged. I mean, also, somebody can grab your gun really fast and turn it on you without... Uh, having to rack, rack, uh, put around in the chamber. I don't know. You know, there are so many infinite possibilities of things that can happen. It's funny because you you can send me lots of video clips of mm -hmm. cases where um, someone successfully defended themselves and wouldn't have been able to had they not had a round of chamber. And I acknowledge all of that. And I can send you right back a whole bunch of videos. People some... getting convicted of doing stupid things, right? Yeah. So it's really a personal judgment. And like I say, I. I kind of split the baby because those those weapons that I don't handle a lot that sit in a gun safe at my house in case I ever need them in emergency, that's the kind of situation where I might not want to have to chamber around. I want to be ready to go. But carrying around town in a in a, in our very safe areas in you know Scottsdale yeah. or Chandler here, maybe I, not. I guess the analogy that I think about when I'm doing this is that I don't put my seatbelt on if I think I'm going to drive in a crazy place or if I think there's going to be a problem. I get in the car and put my seatbelt on because it's not always up to me. Uh, I don't. I think I'm a very safe driver and so I, I will avoid accidents and all those things but sometimes you just did and there's no time in that moment to put your seatbelt on. you got to have it on ahead of time. As much of a pain as it is. Now how do I deal with that? I carry around in the chamber every day but I ameliorate any danger of a negligent discharge by I never or to the absolute minimum possible I don't administratively handle my firearm so it comes on and off my person in the holster so I'm not I don't even have a chance to do that I never take it off to put it anywhere in the car it stays in its holster all the time with the trigger completely covered so that's not possible now of course I'm a doofus that's got about 11 billion times more training with a firearm than most people uh, than all I mean I mean, like, you know, where the bell curve ends and, like, tapers off to nothing. That's me over here, right? I think I just passed 500 hours of firearms training in my life. So, um, which is fine, but, uh, uh, you know, okay, police officers had 60 hours at least in the academy. Great. And, and this is where I say to everybody here, the answer to me is to do things that don't lead to administrative problems, that don't lead to, to, uh, to chances to administratively have a negligent discharge, and it also is incumbent on us to then get the training so that you are getting to the range regularly and practicing safe firearms handling skills. I also even now, okay, so shameless YouTube industry shill here, okay? Um, I'm an HK brand ambassador and so HK sends me guns and money. Okay, that's cool, right? Not everybody has that. But even before that, I had a second gun that had a blocked barrel and, and all that stuff that I put stuff in that couldn't be loaded. That was my dry fire gun. That was my practice firearm. So that again, I don't, I'm not loading and unloading a gun because that's when problems happen. So I think if you do carry around in the chamber and I recommend you do, you have to do some things that greatly ameliorate the risk of administrative handling of your firearm. Yeah, at the end of the day, you're talking about a personal choice and everybody's different and everybody's training is different. Everybody's situation is different. And, you know, even when you make the analogy to seat belts, it's not a uniform position that wearing your seat belt is a safer thing either. There was a, <laughs> there was a study, I think it was out of Canada, that uh, showed that in, in certain types of car accidents, because you have your seat belt on, then sort of the, aim, the impact is concentrated in fewer areas. And if you don't have the seat belt, you maybe get more bounces and the energy is spread more evenly around your body and it causes less injury. So these are these ought to be personal choices. Even in the case of the seatbelt, it ought to be a personal choice. That's my opinion on it. And um, if people are free to change their mind at any time, I think the bottom line is be safe. Amen. And you gotta be safe 
to avoid a negligent discharge and you gotta be safe to defend yourself if you have an emergency situation. We can't resolve everything for everybody. I'm gonna give you a lesson, a, a made a narrative lesson out of this one, okay? Mark and I didn't script this out, all right? I knew he said, hey, I'm not a big fan of people carrying with a round in the chamber. We talked a couple weeks ago and that came out and I was like, ooh, we need to fight about that on camera. But we didn't script it out. We didn't have this discussion ahead of time. But two things for you. Number one, I think through this discussion, we realized we're really not that different. We're nearly, not nearly as different as maybe you would have first said when you said, he said no, I said yes. So that's important. Number two, uh, two reasonable people can have a discussion while respecting each other, come to different conclusions at the end of the day, and if we do that without rancor and respecting each other's position, then maybe we get somewhere and things get better. I wonder if that could affect other things, like the way we discuss politics and life. And Amen, my brother. And the important freedom point, you get to decide how you carry your firearm. I get to decide how I carry my firearm. As long as we're peaceful and acting appropriately, no one else should have anything to say about it. Amen to that. And and uh, I know Mark at his core is a libertarian like I am. He says, I don't think you should have to wear your seatbelt. Amen to that. Get out of my life. You know, we joke, libertarians taking over the world to leave you the heck alone. And uh, at our core, we're going to do that. So at the end of the day, um, I'm right. So listen to me and get highly trained and then carry however you want. And hope you don't have a negligent discharge. And never have a negligent discharge.